Tato. Th thank you for the organizing committee for bringing me back up to the far north. I'm not sure if you're going to hear this. I really appreciate it. It's a very interesting community to come back to. And I really appreciate following Nicole because she gave me a lot to think about. And, uh, and I'm, I guess I'm, I would say I, I'm, I feel I'm on the same trajectory. But when I think historically, it, back to the turn of the 19th, 20th century, back to the 1930s, you saw a huge outgrowth of cooperatives then. And I'm just wondering if that was kind of missing that historical part. So in the future, I think we can go along with that at self-resilience, that localization is going to, this, what I'm going to have to say today may, I hope, just point this a little bit over this way, that's better, help you on that, on that way. So I, I think we've had a couple of excellent days here at the Ahu Centre. I know I've learned a lot. I've learned a huge amount about different ways that people can work together. And I've been thinking, and I've given this some thought before I came up here, about how cooperatives can be used to help develop the far north economy. Okay, so I'm going to give you a succinct definition of a cooperative. Please don't try and memorize it. It's, it there won't, there's not going to be a test at the end. So a cooperative is an enterprise. It is collectively owned, and it's democratically controlled by member users for their mutual benefit and from which benefits are derived and distributed equitably on the basis of use. So here we have, that's just a succinct, I, I, made, I made that one up, I, I pieced together, there are about five or six different, dif different definitions around the world, I put that one together where I thought that would be the most appropriate. But really, I'm going to leave that up so you can write it down if you want to. What I want to focus on today are relationships. Because that's what cooperatives are all about. I'll wait a minute because people are still writing that down. So relationships. Relationships bring us together. They reinforce the connections between people. When you understand the relationships that are deeply embedded in cooperative model, and I'm sorry someone doesn't like the word model, but it is a cooperative model of business, you will be able to set up cooperatives which serve your needs and those of others. So a cooperative is an enterprise. It's a business, but it's a special kind of business. So I'll move on. Next, there we are. Many of the, when you're running a business, whatever that enterprise is, you are engaging in an ongoing series of relationships with people. Many are financial relationships. Now we could count them in dollars, in bitcoins, in ubis and rubies and rubles or whatever. But there's a financial relationships going on. Someone you sell to, someone you buy from, someone you employ. When you get a job, you enter into a financial relationship with your employer. You're selling your ability to work. A hundred years ago, though, people had a strong relationship with the land. And I was really heartened yesterday to hear how many of you still grow food. My great-grandparents lived by growing food in a country called the Ukraine. When my grandparents were old enough to leave home, they went to the nearby towns, which were called Odessa, and Periaslev. One of my grandfathers became a baker, and the other made cloth caps. Looking for a better life, my grandparents ended up in London, where my parents were born and met, and where I came into the world. And I'm sure that many of you have a story to tell that's very much like this one. So going back just a few generations, we can see very different kinds of relationships to those that you and I have now. So my perception is that among the problems people face up here in the far north, and I'm speaking as someone who's sitting comfortably in Wellington, I suppose, is that the kinds of relationships that they have do not allow them to bring home enough of the good quality food that we were talking about yesterday and today. The food that my great-grandparents would have grown. And if you don't earn enough, as we heard, you're less likely to live in a decent home. 
Now, whether you consider yourself to be right, left, or center, whether you have relationships in the business community, a faith community, a tribal community, a political party, or you're a unionist, I think this affects all of us. Cooperatives, as I said, are about relationships that serve people's needs. At their hearts, co-ops are neither left, right, nor center. What's interesting about cooperatives is that as well as some of the relationships that you'll find in ordinary business, you will find other kinds of relationships. Relationships that in many ways I would suggest are healthier. But before we explore cooperatives, let's take a close look at the kind of relationships found in normal businesses which I'm going to describe as investor-owned firms, for want of a shorthand. So whether you're in business yourself or you work for a business, the bottom line, and I use that advisedly, the bottom line is that you're there to serve the needs of those who provide the finance which allows it to operate. And more often than that, that's, that's a bank. If the, if the business is bigger, it might be not owned by an individual or a family, but by investors, of which you may be one. In this kind of situation, you'll probably be using a bank for some kind of your financing, generally the short term. Now, investor-owned firms operate, first of all, to make a profit, and second of all, to increase the value of the business for those who own it. So those of you who run it and those of you who work for it are both there to serve the needs of capital. Now, this is an observation. This is not a complaint. This is what business is about. That's, that's it. Capital is needed. So, oh, sorry, I'm skipping. I believe that in a cooperative enterprise, the relationship between capital and the business is the other way around. Capital is needed in a co-op, and it serves the need of the enterprise. You see, a cooperative is in business to serve the needs of its member owners, however those members define that need or their needs. The members could be families wanting to buy food, dairy farmers wanting to sell milk, orchardists wanting to buy supplies, craftspeople wanting to sell what they make, shopkeepers wanting to purchase what they need in their shop more cheaply, or perhaps people, just simply people who, who want financial services. Importantly, in this video, we saw mention of the cooperative principles. Now, as far as I can see, cooperatives are the only business form which has a set of values and principles. I mean, I can't imagine Wall Street saying that well, this is our values and principles and every, country that every company that lists on Wall Street has to follow these values. But cooperatives have these values and principles. So, to me, and I know this is very much a personal point of view, these principles and those values can sound a bit like a religious credo, and for some people they are. In the years that I worked for New Zealand Cooperatives Association, a number of people approached me who told me that they believe in cooperatives. I would say that these principles and the values that underpin them are a guide to action. And I think that's where their importance is. It's what you do with them. Cooperative values and principles can be particularly useful both when you're wanting to start a cooperative and also a few years down the line when you're wondering how members might be a little, a little better served. And I call this adding value to a business by adding values. It's fundamental to what makes the cooperative, of, in my view, a better kind of business. Now, so what do you do? What do you need to do when you're thinking of starting a cooperative? Well, the first thing is you've got to look at the problem that you're facing. Define that problem. Examine it as clearly as you can. And ask the question, how do I solve that problem? And when you come up with the answer, I don't know, you go, how can we solve that problem? Is a cooperative the right way for us to solve that problem? It may be, it may not be. So to see whether you could use the cooperative model, you have to define the relationship between the people who might benefit from the new enterprise. And in particular, what will the financial relationship be between the member users and their cooperative? So 
Are the members of your owners of your cooperative going to be consumers? Are they going to be producers? Employees or workers or a mixture? Or perhaps even shopkeepers or other business people? Are there any artists or craft workers here today? Just a few? Okay. Imagine, please, that you're going to get together at the end as a, and you're going to get together and you're going to talk about opening up a shop. One of you can see the need to open a shop and set up a website which will not only sell your own work, but that of everybody. Uh, it's good to get a number of things clear before we start. I'm counting myself as one of this group now. What exactly is the financial relationship between each craft worker, as member owners, and our cooperative? How much capital will each of us need to put in to get the co-op up and running? And if we need to raise money from outside our circle, how will we do this? Then we ask, what percentage of the sale price of our art, of our crafts, will we as members get at the end of a month? And how much will the co-op retain to finance the ongoing running costs? Will each member of the co-op member user need to spend some time working for the cooperative? If so, how much time? Because this is time that we may not be able to use to work on creating the items we sell. Is the cooperative going to pay anyone to work for it? A manager, a bookkeeper, a cleaner? And what work will the co-op outsource? Legal advice, I expect so. Creating and maintaining a website, perhaps. What about the social media marketing? Or cleaning the shop windows? Business coaching, perhaps, that's worth considering. So it's one thing to succeed as a business, it's another thing to succeed as a cooperative. You've got to put different kinds of energy into succeeding in the cooperative. What help will the co-op need to ensure its success as a cooperative? How will the co-op, let's assume that there's about 40 or 50 of us now, how will the co-op's board and the managers get the right level of member engagement? And in my experience, this is the number one issue that co-ops face, that's member, air, member engagement. It's that members don't understand what their co-op is and how they get the best stuff from it. And it's an area which I have consulted and I continue to consult about with a number of co-ops. So cooperatives are about people coming together and their relationships. And this is the most recognised virtue of the cooperative model. At the same time, the economic commentators and the financial journalists, the lawyers and the accountants are not shy to tell us that cooperatives are dinosaurs. They allege, do you love that word? They allege that cooperatives are inherently less efficient than investor-owned companies because of their concern for their community of users rather than the profitability of capital. What nonsense. Cooperatives worldwide have more than a billion members. Um, a former member of the European Parliament, Dame Pauline Green, is now president of the International Cooperative Alliance. She said in a speech recently, which was in Washington, to a group of co-ops, one billion people didn't join a cooperative for idealistic reasons. They joined because of all their co-ops did for them, their families and their future. She's pointing to an important fact about successful cooperatives. People may join a co-op for the economic benefit that membership provides, but it's then up to those members who do understand the cooperative spirit who have felt it to work to develop that co-op and make it a success. Now, research in Australia has shown this quite clearly. And I'm thinking of a piece of research which is this wonderful title, Member Loyalty and Cooperative, The Critical Role of Emotional Value and Affective Commitment. So in this piece of research, what we learn is that cooperative members wear four hats. They are an investor. They put money into it, they put time into it, they put sweat. They put all kinds of effort and energy into it. They're a patron. That means that they either buy from the co-op or they sell to the co-op. They are financially involved. There's a, the, the relationship. Thirdly, they're owners. It's their business. They may have another business at home. They may just be a consumer or a family, but that co-op is their business. And also, they're a community member. Now, it's however that cooperative defines their own community. 
And in different countries and in different cooperatives, they will define that community differently. And this is a possible pitfall for a cooperative, which you've got to be watch out from, but that you don't define that, oh, our community is just us, the members, and those in the next door or the other side of the road, well, they're not part of our community. So it's just something that you have to be aware of. But I would suggest, though, that for a lot of cooperatives, when you develop that cooperative community spirit, that it, it overflows. And I think we saw that in Christchurch with the farming army. I would su suggest that almost all the farmers who sent their digging machinery up to Christchurch after the earthquakes were members of one or perhaps even four or five cooperatives. So what I can tell you is this, balancing the relationships between these four roles, very different roles, it feels like you're choreographing a dance. And interestingly, the conclusion of the research was this. I'm going to read this out. I hate death by PowerPoint, but I'm going to read it. But I'm going to read this because it's important. Member user loyalty is driven primarily by emotional value and affective commitment, not fi financial or functional value. Now, does this sound like the kind of enterprise that you'd want to be involved in? That's what I'm going to ask you. American professor Michael Cook spoke at a cooperative conference in Wellington in 2012. One of the things he told us at the conference was that the average life of the reg regular, I can't say regular, investor-owned company in America was seven years. But research in the USA, he told us, shows that the average life of a co-op is around 60 years. So what we saw from the Australian research is to make sense this sense. There's no need to pay a dividend to investors. So cooperative members are patient. They are aware that their cooperative will do less business during the lean years and more business in the better years. Member, I mean, we can see this, we see this in New Zealand, in, especially in the farming sector when you look at the agricultural co-ops, that member, support, member owners support their co-ops in bad times as well as good times. It's there to serve their needs, not earn them profits. So now I've got a question for you. Does a cooperative exist for the benefit of all the members or for the benefit of each individual member? Your thoughts, please. Both. Lada, come. Both. Well, my thoughts are um, actually it should be for the benefit of all members, but in fact, because cooperatives behave differently, especially in Fonterra, it is shifting to individual members and as if it were private corporate behavior. In other words, cooperatives are on a, on a, on a line. Cooperatives are on a continuum, we're being told, yes. and, and it's shifting. shifting. It's shifting, we're being told, from everybody's benefit to the benefit of each individual member, like or in Fonterra. selected members. Yeah, so is there any other views? All members. All members over there. They're, they're not mutually exclusive in a successful co-op. Thank you. Anybody else? I, both, both, both. Both? Over there? Over there, yes? Um, we looked at some um, networks in the UK and they have a rule. To be a member of a network, you have to be... 50% of, of the energy of the co-op will go into the membership and 50% will go into the members. So 50% of the energy will go into the network and 50% into the members. That's in the UK of a cooperative. That's one. Any other comments? Benefit the whole community. Benefit the whole community. Okay. Well, this is my, I'll give you my view that if you think that the cooperative is for the benefit of all the members, and I think you're living in North Korea. <laughs> if you think that it's for the benefit of each individual member, then you're probably a member of the ACT Party. And I'm, here I'm being very great. It's got to be a balance. And at any point in the life of a cooperative, that balance changes along that continuum that our colleague over there described at the beginning. And it's something that the co-op members need to be aware of. You don't want to be too much one way and too much the other way. You're looking after your members as the members would want, and then members can... Remember that principle, concern for community. Those members are part of a community, or many communities, and that there's that... There's that concern there. So, cooperatives operate to benefit member owners. It's a bit like this. What I love is the way that the bottom big 
collective fishes, or well, the big fishes looking backwards over his shoulder. Uh, it's, it sums up, for me, what bring, the good reasons what, that bring people together into co-ops. But let's get serious again. This, this is, is very funny. funny. There are three points of difference between running an enterprise and a cooperative and other ways of doing business. So, basically, you, you build them. The first principle is the, called the user-owner principle. The people who own and finance the cooperative are those who use it. Point two is called the user control principle. The people who use the cooperative are those who control it. And point three is the unit benefit principle, that the purpose of the cooperative is to provide and distribute benefits to the members on the basis of their use. So once you've built your co-op, that's your three principles, the points of difference between a cooperative and an ordinary business. If your co-op, though, is small, to survive on its own, the members' users need a very solid understanding of what they're doing and why. For want of a better phrase, I'm going to call this the cooperative spirit. But the question that comes to me when I was thinking about the conference here is, what if there was a way of clustering cooperatives together in a region, perhaps? I guess I was thinking about my love of classical music. I particularly love orchestral pieces, such as the violin concerto. If I played the violin, which I don't, thank, thankfully, other people would say, I'd much prefer to be an orchestra member than the soloist in a concerto. If I played sport, which I have to confess I don't, I'd far sooner play a team game like soccer than be the golfer. I feel that we're much stronger with our arms around each other's shoulders than when we stand on our own. So too with cooperatives. So looking at clustering cooperatives, there are in fact a number of models to do it. Someone over there mentioned the most famous one, which is the Mondragon, group of cooperatives in Spain's Basque country. Started in the 40s by a Catholic priest. It now employs or has members in the hundreds of thousands. Having a bit of problems with its washing machine factory at the moment, but you know, they'll, they'll sort that one out, I don't doubt. But today, I want you to draw your attention to the evergreen cooperatives of Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland was once home to more Fortune 500 companies headquarters than any other city except New York. Steel dominated the city for decades, but when the steel industry died, the city more or less died too, losing half a million people and leaving a lot of poverty. So here are the two issues that the people of Cleveland were facing. One, the need to create good quality jobs. Two, the need to anchor capital so it doesn't get up and leave. Does this sound familiar? So for the people of Cleveland, evergreen cooperatives are a means to an end. This is what they do. We're talking about can we call the in cooperative the, the cooperative movement called community wealth building. Hang on, we've lost a slide. I've, never mind. Have I? Hold on. We've lost a slide. Never mind. Okay, so let's try to go back. No, nope, we lost a slide. All right. So this is what the the Cleveland cooperatives are doing. They empower people. They take people who are unemployed, who are depressed, who are probably having bad social situations, and they empower them. They create jobs. They build wealth, and they keep it in the community. The cooperatives in Cleveland offer self-help opportunities. This isn't about getting a handout, even a temporary one or a startup. It's about getting a self-help opportunity. Bringing people together who are previously very atomized they are developing a sense of social cohesion. So what they are practicing is a socially conscious, cooperative entrepreneurship. And what we're looking at in Cleveland is a collection of reasonably large-scale worker-owned co-ops linked together by a, a non-profit community corporation in New Zealand speak, that would be a charitable trust. But what makes this complex particularly interesting is the way it is anchored to its community. In the middle of this very poor area are two major hospitals and a university. They can't get up and leave. They're not going to go off to China or Indonesia or Mexico. And Evergreen has a vision of community wealth building in five different ways. So here's number one. 
They leverage a portion of the multi-million multi -million dollar annual business expenditures of anchor institutions in the surrounding area. That means that those institutions which can't get up and go, they have an annual revenue. Let's use some of that. Don't send it all off outside the town. We can do some of that work. Number two, they are establishing a network of cooperative enterprises based on community wealth building and ownership models designed to service the needs of these institutions, in this case, the universities and the hospitals. Their third thing they're doing is creating environmentally sustainable energy and green collar jobs. Fourthly, they're, they're linking to expanding areas of the economy, some of which we, we saw earlier today, which gets some public investment, such as local food, sustainable energy, and they're also looking at our aging population. And the most interesting one is this one. They're developing and financing the management capacities to build scale. Part of the end-of-year surplus of, of the co-ops they're creating in Cleveland go into a fund which helps to start new cooperatives, which again, all part of this virtuous circle. It's not going outside of Cleveland and it's not really going outside the community, it's staying there. So in contrast to investor-owned firms which have every interest in cutting costs wherever possible, locally rooted, sorry, that's a, not a New Zealand word, is it? Locally firmly placed co cooperative enterprises are inherently responsible to people in place. When people have a stake in the enterprise where they work, the health of the community comes first. These are good jobs. And the land, the air, the water are all treated with greater care. Now, I'd like to share a short video with you on the Evergreen Cooperatives. Matangi, please. You've got a, in your conference packs, you've got a document. It's called Starting a Cooperative One Step at a Time. Consider, please, whether you have the energy to put into building a new cooperative enterprise. Cooperative needs champions. Cooperative entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs. Um, I'm just going to put on a slide with a book, a book, book list, three books. If you don't read any other books on co-ops, please get these. I know Helen had them, and they may well be in a, in a library that the council will be putting together. Um, I'll leave you with just one thought. Remember this, you can't, but we can. Thank you. I'm not going to go over what Ramsey has just explained because I think he did it very well. I just want to um, ex uh, really say what I've heard in this conference over these last two days. Um, really, it's about locking uh, the businesses into our community so that we benefit from the businesses and the profits that they actually make. In the far north, cooperatives offer succession planning for existing businesses in our communities that we can't afford to lose and they have good community solutions for our existing retail if your dairy is in threat of closure there is a, a proper business model that locks that business back into the community so that everybody benefits from being a member of a cooperative it also actually allows us to create new business opportunities when the conventional say you can't do it there's no way you can do that we're not going to give you money for that it's not profitable enough and things like that i'm still a member of two cooperatives in britain the cooperative group and the phone cooperative and the reason i remain, remain a member is to support those cooperatives over there as well as receive the benefits of being a member and it's traditional for me if my mother was here now she would tell you a co-op uh, dividend number. It's imprinted on the brain. It's part of the DNA of uh, community consumer cooperatives. She knows where the benefit is going to be paid from her using of that cooperative. Marina mentioned yesterday about the uh, up-and-coming bee industry in the far north and the region. We've got some very unique factors here that suggest that our bee industry is extremely unique and highly profitable. We are in danger of being hijacked and being just the providers of the manuka honey and the bee products. A bee cooperative offers you the solution 
of owning the supply chain and making sure that the benefits of that supply chain are locked into our communities. I think it's something that Tararua are looking at and need our, our help to make that come to fruition. We are also uh, blessed in this area of having organic bee producers. Very difficult to get in the world these days with the amount of pollution. And it's something we should be shouting from the rooftops and actually celebrating and supporting and moving forward. The danger if we don't actually have a business model that reflects our community values is that we will kill the uh, goose that lays the golden egg. There are already now beehives going into areas where there is not enough food to feed bees. The land can only support so many bees. A cooperative based on principles and values would actually begin to self-regulate itself through community effort and uh, action that will actually say it's in everybody's best interest to actually build an industry that is actually sustainable instead of trying to rip out the profits very quickly and uh, destroy an industry before it can get off the ground. That's just one of the uh, cooperatives uh, that potentially could happen in this area. There is a potential to actually develop food cooperatives, uh, producer cooperatives, We've got some of the best soils in the country. We've been telling about our competitive advantage about growing food quicker. We've also got the possibilities of energy co-ops in our area. So really, um, for me, and, uh, and the way I see it is, if we want to own our future and actually have economic participation in our communities, the co cooperative business model is one that certainly needs looking at and growing in our area. There are lots of great ideas. There are lots, lots of good um, things that could become a thriving business that actually employs our people, gets our people in, involved in business, and actually feel valued in business. And I'll leave my contribution there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. I really resonate with what you just said. So my name is Karina. I'm from Switzerland. Is that okay with the mic, like this? Um, and I um, came a long way to New Zealand. I am a trained economist, but luckily I'm not only an economist, so I also studied other things, so I'm not completely lost in this world. And <laughs> uh, I mainly studied economics because I wasn't uh, out of rebellion, because I wanted to know how it works. And what I'm really passionate about is cooperatives. And for the last seven years, I've been working with cooperatives, and I'm really convinced that it's a powerful tool to empower those communities that are economically disadvantaged, excluded from the society. So I want to give some examples of cooperatives I've been working with over the past seven years. I've been mainly working with worker-producer cooperatives. Seven years ago, I went to New York to work with a community center in Brooklyn. And and this community center, I supported them in setting up a um, cleaning ladies cooperative with immigrant workers. So these people were Mexican immigrants, didn't have papers, and didn't have an employment, and they didn't speak English. Anyhow, they managed to gather together and create a company that now has a million dollar turnover a year. Instead of earning $2 an hour, they now earn $30 an hour. And they also produce their own ecological cleaning products. The cooperative is called We Can Do It. And that's, they did it. So um, that's one example. I was so inspired by this example that I went back to Switzerland and created a cooperative in, in Geneva, also with a group of immigrants um, who were doing a training on how to do housekeeping. And I, after they graduated, I gathered them together and were like, what, what do you want to do next? You have two options. Um, you can go and work for a cleaning company, or you can start your own business together. That's way more fun. So we did it, again, and it, and, and it really empowered them to work in a group of people. So empowering. Um, one of my travels took me to Nepal, and in Nepal, um, I went to a village that had a lot of problems because the youth were leaving the village to go out and seek economic opportunities. And so we gathered together with the villagers and explored what can we do. And they, they were like, oh, we want to um, develop our 
agriculture industry, our fisheries, our tourism. And they didn't have much. They all had their backyards, little pieces of land. But we managed to create an eco-tourism cooperative, an agriculture cooperative, and a fisheries cooperative. And now they are all producing some vegetables, pulling them up together. One truck goes once a week to the to the town, Pokhara, that is a few kilometers away, and they sell their organic veggies to the local markets. So these are some examples, and they, what I really, really love about these examples and, and cooperatives in general is that it shows that there's not finding a job or starting your own business as a solo entrepreneur aren't the only options. Solutions often lie within the community and through coming together, we can really create something powerful. That's one point. Second point I love about cooperatives is that you can start really, really, really small. I really like the comment about the cops yesterday that they're being used to, to grow seedlings, I think. That's, that could be the start of a cooperative. Some people could come together and say, oh, let's grow seedlings and sell them to a market. It can start really small and grow really huge. And um, the main thing I love about cooperative is that it's, like Ramsey said, it's about relationship and it's really fun to create something in a group. It's really just an exciting project to do. And so now I'm in New Zealand and I've come here on an international fellowship and I really want to thank the organization that is sponsoring me, the Mercator Foundation and the and Department of Foreign Affairs in Switzerland. They, they're sponsoring me to work for the most innovative organizations in the world and learn from them. And I found that organization in, in Wellington, and Spiral, it's called. It's a collective of social entrepreneurs, almost like a cooperative of social entrepreneurs. And um, in my early days there, I asked what other examples of collective entrepreneurship are there in New Zealand. I asked a colleague of Shauna from Akina, and, and he told me, well, actually, to be honest, um, Maori tradition has been doing this forever, so maybe you can look at what they do and learn from them. So I really um, started looking around and feel like I can learn so much and that this tradition of doing business collectively and collaborating and having, taking into account the, the quadruple bottom line and all these things, I can really learn so much from that tradition and just I'm impressed how well the communities I work with are actually working in, in groups together. I haven't seen that anywhere else. So I'm, I'm here not as an expert, but as a, to learn. And um, I'm working at the moment with a Mirai in Wellington and with the Kete Kai program. Kete Kai um, is a, flyer will come up in a second. Kete Kai is an educational program that teaches, um, it teaches the most vulnerable families how to grow their own kai in their backyards, how to grow organic, Kai, according to permaculture principle and also uh, Maori traditional growing principles. So they started educating people to do that, and then they started using those skills to go and build gardens for the community, for schools, and for private people's backyards. Now, um, I've joined them, and together we're, we're turning this into a sustainable local cooperative, the Kete Kai Co-op, with four main services. We want to build gardens for the community, do food education, so pass on our learnings, uh, sell the, the produce we grow, and sh um, do a local soup kitchen, so share our food. And, and this is just one example of how a group of people who nobody believed in initially, these are long-term unemployed, very and disadvantaged families, they can stand up, come together, and actually create real, real value for society. So I'm really impressed by this group. Um, how, I, how do you do it? I, I don't have the magic answer, but I think there's five simple steps on how you can facilitate this really easily. So first thing you do, Look around you, what is the abundance in the room, outside the room, which people are around you, what skills are there. 
Second thing, you build a strong team. You have fun together, get to know each other. It's really about relationships. Third thing, build a common dream together. And um, just what do you want to create with this community? Fourth thing, make it happen. Stop talking and start doing. Very important. You can talk a long time. And then celebrate regularly after every little step you achieve. So that's a real, it's, it, it's just about yeah, coming together and starting something, starting small. When I told this group of people that I was coming up here to Kaitaia to this conference, they were like, wow, up there, there's so much land, so many opportunities to grow, to grow food and to, to do this, this type of work. And yeah, I totally agree now, seeing all the land that's here. There's so much abundance here. I, I've just spent a weekend with the Life Hack team uh, looking at well-being and technology, and I found the people were so passionate and creative and talented, and they worked really, really well in groups. Coming to this conference, I see all these opportunities, like Gary mentioned, and honey cooperatives could come out of this, organic growers cooperatives, tourism cooperatives, or a cooperative for young people who are unemployed. There's so much abundance in this room, so I want to just end with a question. What opportunities, what dreams do you have for these communities? What opportunities do you see for cooperatives in Kaitaia? Thank you. Uh, and ha hasn't it been rich, all the speakers? Um, oh, no, uh, other one. We coming up? So, so rich, the speakers, and of course, all, all the people here who haven't spoken, who are no doubt people who hold this community together and, and build it every day. Um, so recognising you all here who aren't jumping about or grab the microphone. Um, the, and of course it's pretty hard to get up and speak after the power of the oratories of the, the local people here. It's a bit daunting to, to take a microphone here. Uh, I, I have a cooperative story. Um, but I, I'm just going to do a little recap. See, we're kind of at the end of all the speaking thing, and Ken can shoot me if, if I talk too long. Um, and knowing that we're now going to go into some um, after morning tea, into this fabulous session where we, we, there's this great facilitated process that's going to see, see where the energy goes into real action after this, which Queen is going to lead us in, so that's fab. That I normally talk... Um, I came here... To two years ago and gave a talk to the Transition Town group and I normally talk about creating community resilience and revitalisation and, um, and but, but I have a whole lot of different names for, for talks I give, you know, um, Facing the Future with Nicole, um, Community Solutions for Today, uh, a talk I gave at the Permaculture, I titled it Decentralising Everything because I think that's possible now and, and kind of necessary in some ways. It doesn't have to be everything, but, you know, most of everything. You know, food, water, money, um, you know, those kind of things. Governance. Um, and, and I have also given uh, the talk under the name How I Survived the End of the World. Um, and that's, that's probably because I suppose I've been a bit, of a, a bit of a doomer for some, you know, in the past. And, and we've covered some of these topics here today, some pretty daunting topics about the state of the environment, the state of the economy, you know, we could have got into energy and the like. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe this is in my DNA, not just because I was brought up with some, you know, kind of biblical expectations of the future, very negative story, which I, so I, I kind of, I, I no longer subscribe to that. I don't believe in the end of the world anymore because I've, I've lived too much of it in my life to kind of, but it has been a backbone. And maybe it goes further back in my DNA to, to being Irish, you know, 350 years ago, my family got their houses demolished and we got moved off our land back then. I'm not trying to show off or anything, um, but, you know, we, we were colonised and, and the Irish never had it easy after that. And in actual fact, my, my grandfather's family was driven out, um, you know, in about 1915 because we were political and, you know, luckily no longer political, but, um, and, and ended up here, ironically, by by the British, I suppose, who had colonised us. And, you know, I'm half Dutch, so they were kind of colonial people, so I'm in the middle of being a colonist and being colonised. But, but we, we, um, 
we try to look to the future and, and it's not all silly or, or, or just in our DNA because ev everyone on the planet at this point in time is, is pretty much colonised. You know, even, even the mad, powerful people by their own psychopathy are kind of <laughs> colonised in their minds. But, but, you know, these things, any of these things stop and, and there would be others and our, our world as it is today seriously gets impacted. Supermarket do doors close. That's it, you know, it's a different world, or government money stops coming, or the central banking system, or the world trade routes, you know. I mean, WW3 seems to be rock and rolling along, and it's pretty crazy out there. People should just go home. They should just leave the buildings, go home, start a garden, you know, be happy, go fishing, you know. <laughs> and they can do it, but while they're making their mind up, they're dragging us along in a crazy kind of way. So, um, so normally in my talks, I try and con textualize all this and by saying, well, it's an exciting time on planet Earth, you know, um, everything's on the line, you know, e everything, you know, what's on the line as well is it's not, it's not just our future, it's our past, our whole human story is on the line right now on our, on our beautiful planet, on our magical planet, the only one we've, we've, we know has got life on it so far and, and here we are and just... And things lost that we're not going to get back that hopefully will fuel our, our grief and our uh, grief into humility and to resolve for what we do protect and carry on with. Um, you know, as I've said, some evil MFs are, you know, being left to run the show. It might not be their fault, but we sure as hell don't want them there. We've got a crazy monetary system. Um, and, of course, the big question is, you know, that kind of is, is, is what comes next? You know, I've got, I got three kids, three teenage daughters. What comes next? And, uh, and the expectations are not all positive, I have to say, as, as we know, you know, and you can, you can pick, pick your favourite apocalypse to choose from. Um, <laughs> but you know what, someone once said, whatever happens, don't let the crisis not happen. Because we don't change when we're comfortable. When we, when, we don't change when we're in our comfort zone. And I'm sure you're not everyone here is, all, we're not always comfortable, but in the past 50 years there's been this kind of materialistic comfort. You know, and sort of, uh, and, or, or a dream or a haze or something. And, and so luckily now our, our, our asses are on fire. And, you know, so we're, we're going to jump. Jump, MFs, jump. It's, you know, it's time. And, um, and, and it's, so we have this reality revolution is here. And that's, that's, it's going to be good for us. And, and it's probably just what we've been waiting for. It's breakthrough time. And this is it. And it's in this room. And it's in rooms all across the planet. People are, are, are in the same place. They're doing it. So it's, it's, a, it's a magical time. It's a good time. And we've got more tools now than ever before. We've got, got 10,000 years of, of social and technological innovation to draw on. We have all our history to draw on. We have these new tools, you know. Um, and so... And we can do things really fast. We can find the money, we can find the people, the resources, the ideas, the designs, and we can, we can take the best practices and put it into action, you know, today, by tomorrow. And, um, and we have the design capability. I go on these things. Yeah, there's this fabulous design capability, and you invent your own design. We have the ethical business framework. It's been on the table for 20 plus years. Social and environmental excellence. No company should be performing unless it is following these templates. And I had the good fortune to meet people who, who really led the way, you know, who, who did things like you wouldn't believe, who changed paradigms, and, and, and they're here in this community. So, so we have the design capability, we, we have all these things, we have the crisis, so we're all in good. But what I come back to is, is that it probably our best tool is that we have available is our newfound ability to, co -op, to cooperate and collaborate, you know? No, nothing new, nothing new here in Aotearoa to the people who let it. And I have to say, you know, I'm always surprised talking about, you know, that the, as... You know, I don't have another passport, Robert. I don't have another one. This is it. This is my home. I don't have, have another home to go to. So I'm appreciative of the graciousness of the Maori people who everything that they've been put through, that they allow me to be here and to be a citizen of this country. And I'm really thankful. And I never understand how people aren't thankful for the graciousness that you've lent to us. You know, a bit of a forced marriage, but here we go. We're going we're gonna to make this work. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> every family has problems. The, we, um, and, but this power co collaboration, that's it. 
That's, that's what we got. And, and people are reinventing it, rethinking it. There's these fabulous platforms. The young people are taking it second nature. You know, we can do it in so many ways. Oh, I'll forget the story. Innovation, we need to have innovation centres. Um, the good news is money wants to be free. And, and I, I just heard news that Bill Mollison, father of permaculture, passed away. Is that correct? Oh, maybe it's an urban rumour. Oh, who told me that? What a terrible thing. Anyway, where he's alive, his words live on. He said recently, it's not enough to grow our own food and be permaculturalists. We have to be our own bankers. Uh, you said that in 1981. Oh, okay, 1981. God, well, he knew it then. We have to be our own bankers. We have to be our own money. Some people see this as a political thing. If, we, if we're not in charge of our own money, we don't have our own sovereignty. And a lot of people say, if we want to stop the millions of people on the streets of the world right now, all across the world, protesting that you don't always see on the mainstream television, if, if instead of running at the tanks, if we jump, jump sideways into using other money, then, then that would be it. So we've got to grow our own food because our food is... is is like that. We have all these things. And I'll just finish on a cooperative story, Ken, is the Saikatsu in Japan. 200 housewives in the 60s were worried about the rising price of milk. 200 Japanese housewives. So they banded together and formed a cooperative. And over the since then, it's grown to represent 400,000 people, 250,000 households. They have a billion yen of their own money, their own bank, which they loan out to people within their network who want to set up businesses. They bought their own dairy farms. Stop complaining about Fonterra. Buy your own dairy farms. They bought their own dairy farms that they run organically. They put people up for council. They run their own cooperatives and shops and daycare and stuff. You know, they took the power. 200 women, price of milk, and now they've got their own banking system, their own farms. They lobby against GMOs and, and health safety issues. They're protecting their kai. They are empowered. They're running their own shots. And, and that's to us. And one last thing. Um, I've heard a lot about the young ones here and that. And, and we haven't got some kids, but I'd like to put $10 in a pot for if there's any kid locally that Seabeck. And I think just hand, you know... Um, if there's some young person coming, if, if everyone puts between one and... Oh, there's $50 on the table, uh, Russell. That's a good start. I'll put up 10. He puts up 50. Some people throw in one if you've got it. If, if, you know, if we've got money, maybe we could have three or 400 bucks in a pot out of this room. There we are. That um, We need a hat or something to pass around. And, and the first young person that comes through the door of Seabeck and says, I've got a crazy idea, give it to them. Thank you, Joe. Cool. Thanks, folks. Um, it's it, more a comment, really, than a question. I was really pleased that you brought up a New Zealand example. Um, I have two New Zealand examples of co-ops. One is in Colville. The Colville co-op was started in 1980 because uh, the local people had to buy up the community store that went bankrupt, and it's still functioning. I, I've lost count of how many years that is, but um, they're still functioning as a co-op and have been a very important employee employer in the Colville district where there isn't much um, work and um, the other one is a much more recent one in Littleton where after the earthquake they tried to um, Little Pico which is the Whole Foods store tried to open and open for a little while but it actually just couldn't function and so they just said oh well we have to make it a co-op and maybe other people have more detail and maybe there are others that people could talk about but I think it's really important that we actually have our homegrown examples They've got 350 co-op members in Littleton, which has got about 350 people in it. Um, I thought about it, went over and Lawrence was talking and I was wondering if, instead of going down and asking Kim.com for his millions, could this situation work, but with a mixed model of investment of, say, some time bank money, council money, iwi money, chuck in a bit of something or other, but most the majority of it coming from within this local community, but not forgetting because um, I, I've used government money to come up with our solutions. So, yeah, I know, find as much answers as we can within ourselves, but let's not cut ourselves off from, that's, that government money is our money. We all pay taxes. Don't think for a minute that Wellington's money is Wellington's money. That's our money too. All I'm saying is for us to think about 
how to work collaboratively, cooperatively, and ensuring that that money comes back to uh, the community to improve our standard of living. Kapoi? Great. Um, okay, so we, there's an opportunity to come and talk to the panel. And um, now, now is the time to really move into action phase. So what do we want to take on out of this conference? This conference is a great opportunity. I'm really, uh, I really respect the intention of this conference of being opening the doors of the council and saying, hey, we are here to support you. And I really deeply respect all the contributions that were here of people who are like, hey, we want to work together on this. We want to collaborate. So that's why we're doing a collaboration cafe. So it's about collaborating around projects that are in the room, around ideas, around concrete projects. It could be something like um, Marina saying, hey, I want to create a Honeybeaks cooperative she can host a table. I'll just quickly co go through the mechanics of it and then take any questions that are still open. A collaboration cafe has two types of people. Red people and blue people. Red people are project hosts. They sit on a table and they don't move. Blue people are contributors. They sit on a table in one round and in the next round, they move to the next table. And in the next round, they move to the next table. Sorry, is that better? Okay, great. And um, in a minute, I will ask people who have ideas or projects to come up and present them in one sentence. They will be project hosts. They will be red or blue? And will they move? Okay, great, got it. Um, and they will say in one sentence, hey, my name is da-da-da, and I want to talk about... My name is Jeff, and I have a dream. <laughs> a local community currency which will benefit not just Kai Tire, but the whole of the far north. It's doable, it's legal, and we can start it. Thank you. Okay, I'm Jane Johnston and I want to talk about a Bay of Islands community centre and this extends from um, or includes Waitangi, Hirudu Falls, Opua, Paihia, Pakaraka and Pukatona areas. So it's a broad catchment. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I've just um, been got hold of some bamboo splitters. We were talking tonight, uh, talking earlier, and decided that we needed to run some workshops on using bamboo, and we're going to make bamboo coffins. Um, my name's Don Groom. I would like to talk about water, key line, hydropower, and Azola. And if you want to know what those are all about, well, come to the table. Uh, kia ora, I'm Laurel. I'm from the Far North Environment Centre. We've got the little space just over there at the lighthouse. Um, I want to put forward that we'll do um, a community network for this group. Um, I think it shouldn't be owned by council. It should actually be community network group and that we should bounce the information and ideas around and that's all sharing via Facebook and or a community presence. We've got a, a space, we've also got a staff member who can facilitate the communications, can share information and it's about saying here's a space that can, um, I, I guess all the information can be shared across all of us. Okay, thanks. Put down your Please everybody put down your contact details there. Hi, um, I'm Cece um, from currently Kere Kere. Um I would like to join this man with the water um, scheme, even though I had in mind, um, I thought, yeah, winter is not the time where we worry about water, but I would like to establish some water collection ideas for the whole of the Far North to ensure ongoing um, food production. Thank you. Kia ora, I'm uh, Brian Innes. I'd like to talk about uh, interest-free um, savings or uh, sharing pools. Um, it's an opportunity to form groups here. There are over 200 people throughout the country who are doing this and we've had 
mortgages of up to $65,000 um, that have been retired as a result of these pools. Uh, we'll be here for the next couple of days too. Thank you. Who hasn't? Hello everyone, my name's Kayleen and I work with the community development team at Far North Reap. And we've been working um, away for the last few months trying to get all the youth services and our young people to work closer together. So I'm interested in harnessing the energy of and um, developing one, what I think is one of our greatest resources and that's our young people. I'm Marina Strukovan, already said, and Gary pronounced too. I would like to set up a organic beekeepers cooperative, which is will be, like I said, model will be land owners, they are members as a beekeepers. So it's what will hold cooperative at assets, land, and the bees. Because bees not fly only in your section, they fly five kilometers radius. So it will be um, uh, all cooperative, all community will be involved to this beekeeping. And we will look, uh, make, make sure we not damage um, our 37 native bees. Our bush will be saved and we will be have a no sugar. It will be real honey. We not by organic standards, not with sugar. We not physical chemical treatments and the other rules. And as, as a constitution for cooperative, it will be. So please join to my cooperative. Kia ora. Um, my name's Mike Finlayson, and before I put forward my idea, um, I'd just like to say um, thanks to Ken. Um, for him and his team getting this together. I'm, I'm just totally impressed with this conference, What's not only what's gone down in this conference, but who is here. Um, I've never seen such a gathering in Kaitaia. So, um, and thanks to the councillors, and um, Di, um, John, uh, and, and the Mayor for, for letting this happen, for making it happen. Um, it's, it's great, it's been such an opportunity for us. My idea is simply um, uh, about two things. It's about uh, youth and unemployment and our environment. How can we put these together? How can we get unemployed youth working in our environment to um, use the environment as a tool to help heal our community? Thanks. Uh, Mike Shaw. Um, Producer co-op. Good afternoon. My name's Sue, Sue Jackson. I'm from the Hokianga. I'd like to put an idea forward for some rural transport. I heard yesterday that the heart of Kaitaia was taken out when Pack and Save was moved one and a half kilometres out. We have a round trip of 130 kilometres. So please support our uh, motion. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. My name is Pākira Heke, and um, I'd like to have a discussion in and around, more generically speaking, creating collaborations and partnerships with Māori people in the region. I'm just interested if we can get together over fresh whole milk. There's plenty of dairy farms around. Maybe someone knows someone who would contribute on that. Um. My name's Eva, and I'm really interested in sustainable, um, affordable homes for our young people, for people who want to have their own home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
So now it will be really nice to see, to hear briefly from every project holder about two main things. The first question is, what are you grateful for? And the second question is, what next step are you most excited about? So just a few sentences capturing the highlights of the session. So what are you grateful for? And what next steps are you most excited about? Before we start that round, I'll already tell you um, that uh, Laurel, I think from the Environment Center, um, volunteered to type up all the contact detail sheets and we'll send them around. Thank you so much, Laurel. If anybody has a problem with their contact details being shared, please let us know, let her know, she's right here. Um, yeah, and now who would like to start sharing? Um, over there, you have the mic. Might as well, oh, thank you. Might as well get it over and done with. <laughs> What am I most grateful for? I think living in the far north, to be honest, it's a fantastic place. I've only been here 11 years, but it just seems like a lifetime. <coughs> um, but it really is wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, you couldn't wish to meet much nicer bunch than you're all here today. So that's what I'm grateful for. Uh, what was the other question? Um, what oh, next what's the next step? Well, I suppose the next step, as far as I'm concerned, is tomorrow when this fine gentleman here and I go and try and do a selling job on the joint community boards on the wisdom of implementing an alternative currency in the far north. So if any of you all feel like lobbying your community board members between now and about half past nine tomorrow morning and say, oi, get on board, it will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm most grateful for this conference happening. I was, Kai Kohi was going to put one on a couple of years ago and it never happened and I thought what a wasted opportunity and here it is and it's brilliant. Thank you. Um, our next steps are um, people to form, who wish to form savings or be part of a savings group um, the, or a sharing group uh, they, they can uh, get together and form groups of their own or join existing groups. Uh, we've got the website that they can follow up on or contact uh, local people who are already in groups. There's a transition towns group. Um, Rebecca's a member. John Kenderdine's a member. There are other people. Um, and, you know, there's nothing to lose. You can just put five dollars in a month or whatever, and use it as a game until you've got confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, what I'm grateful for is the ability to tap into today and yesterday to the mountain of knowledge, experience, and culture that I've sort of come across. It's been absolutely fantastic. And my next step is to take back to the Hokianga. If I take back half of what I've learnt and experienced, it will be 100% and it will be absolutely wonderful. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, who's next? Please just mention briefly your, the project you, uh, you hold first. And uh, our project was creating cooperatives with Māori. Um, uh, what I'm most grateful for is um, that we have created a forum where we can openly discuss these things, uh, the differences between our people with an open mind and hopefully an open heart. Um, the next step that I'm most excited about is um, actually continuing to dis talk with people at this end as well as all around the region, to help discover and identify our unifying vision. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Our group's the um, producers co-op, producing the kai. Uh, so I'm most grateful for our, for, um, for our people, people resource and our land resource, the water, the sunshine, stuff like that. And uh, the, the next step for us is to contact the uh, producers that are already out there and the potential producers, get them together share the vision of working together. Thank you. Great. Okay, 
Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Laurel and we're part of the Far North Environment Centre group. Thank you all for participating. Um, it's about connecting up groups that are already doing amazing mahi in our community, um, whether that be planting or taking kids to sports or, you know, sorry, environmental things, sustainable building, etc., and creating a network that we can all participate in and share information um, in a forum which is online and available and also through newsletters and columns to the newspaper. Etc. But it, it just creates this momentum and um, collectivism amongst us. So thank you all very much, and I'm grateful for Araha and everyone here and participating openly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, our group was uh, water, uh, hydropower, uh, key line, and azola, and uh, I'm uh, grateful for for the. Uh, People to actually, oh sorry, actually to get to understand what I'm talking about because key line is a difficult subject to get your head around unless you can actually see it on the ground. But once you can understand it, it's uh, it's quite magic what it can do. And um, the next step for us would be to form a study group because it's uh, the complications of um, key line and especially if you use it with a Zola, which is an, another entirely different approach um, is uh, needs a lot more research and if we could get a group here together to do this research and um, find out more about the whole thing um, then I think we could start looking to get some funding perhaps to do a study trip to, to Australia where Keyline is really on the go because it's um, nobody in New Zealand as far as I know actually does a Keyline system and um, <clears throat> there are reasons why, because Australia obviously and New Zealand are, are different geologically, but um, the same principles apply, I think. So we, we, we definitely need to do some more study, and uh, if we can get a group going, then I think we're on the way. Thank you. Well done. So, so um, next step uh, for our um, beekeeping uh, bee, bee keep, uh, organic beekeepers, uh, cooperatives. Uh, um, I see that uh, to keep touch uh, with people who want to be keepers and land owners who want to be organic beekeepers and maintain land organically for bees, and as well, uh, hopefully, to contact to council the opportunity about some type of law to uh, help to us uh, keep organic bees, uh, not uh, overpopulate bees on a tight ticker because it's chance to us produce um, quality products, premium one. And most exci exciting was that um, I appreciate how many ad advices and ideas people who come to our table, they gave even some of them new, which I never think about that. It was really helping. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This. Hi there. Um, hi there. Hi there. Um, yeah, my uh, subject was water collection um, to ensure um, that we have enough water in the dry summers. And thank you for some real great support here also from CBAC. Um, to put it in, in sort of a few words, we, we came up with a water order that might be sort of administered with CBAC when they do the energy audit for houses. Uh, we also thought if council could look at um, sort of redirecting maybe some of the fun some of the funds, some of the funds, some of the funds um, from uh, maintaining big water schemes that they're running in the villages and towns and subsidize instead um, building own water collection uh, tanks uh, for every household. So there were a few more ideas, but I felt that was, that was really um, a good take. Maybe, yeah, just addressing um, the council because it's, um, yeah, they have their hands on that. Uh, what I'm grateful for is, yeah, being here with you guys. It's amazing. It's lovely. It's great. And I hope we can do that, like, maybe every second year, maybe a day, you know, just reconvene and see where we got from here. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I, um, our group was talking about establishing a community centre. Um, and what I'm grateful for is that so few people came to our table to talk about it that I got to spend some really quality time with DJ from Mitimiti, who's come up with a brand new idea that I hadn't heard of before. We were going to put drum kits in the Village Green and he's identified all of the top drummers <laughs> between Mitimiti and the Bay of Islands that he wants to come and play down there. So I've got lots of contacts, he's given me lots of good ideas and I'm going to celebrate that. That's what I'm grateful for from our group meetings. Um, and our next step is going to continue those discussions and encourage people to come out and, and play in the Bay of Islands and to join with us in this uh, community facility that we're going to be establishing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we talked about our young people and I'm very grateful for the contributions and the ideas and generally the aroha and, um, and commitment to our young people. And what we look forward to next is taking this back to our young people and connecting them with the resources in this room and in this community and um, helping them build their futures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we spoke about Permitted, maybe not, maybe. Um, all around that, permitted, sustainable, affordable homes. And we also spoke about um, bamboo as a resource and bamboo coffins. Um, I'm really grateful for that moment when I decided that it was a good idea to come up here and share my idea um, because we've got some really great feedback. Um, we've got a few leads on bamboo because we really didn't know much about bamboo. It's not a natural resource here. And lots of ideas about housing. We've been told about um, some people lobbying the Tasman Council um, down in the South Island to have owner responsibility or build a responsibility for their housing. Um, we really want to, I want to be able to, and it came out of the discussion group that um, we need to be able to work with the council and really get affordable, sustainable homes uh, available for people in a, in a much broader sense. And um, so maybe that's one way we can go about it. We've got, we're, I'm excited about creating a group and um, yeah, working with council on these issues. Thank you, thank you. Is there anybody missing? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Eva did mention the, the bamboo, but um, we don't have any knowledge. We're dumb. We're, we're flying blind, totally ignorant about how to use the bamboo. So what I would ask from everybody here, anybody who has any information about how to harvest, how to process, how to prepare, use bamboo, if you could get that information to the Far North Environment Centre, just across the road, uh, that is a place where all that information can be used, brought together. And uh, I would love to see, because there's so many skills, so much exciting stuff happening, that I think it could be a small local industry and anybody who wants to get involved in running that, doing that, building whatever. Coffins was just the first idea that came off the top of our head. But anything that could go with that would be much appreciated. So anybody got any knowledge or knows anybody who's got the knowledge, if you can get that to us, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the money? Oh. Everybody spoke? Yes? Good. Well, that was Collaboration Cafe. Me coming from Switzerland, seeing this community, there's no way to even think that you don't have everything that it takes to put these projects on and bring these to the next level. And um, this was just the beginning, but it showed me that there is, you have everything that it takes. So thank you everybody for participating, coming on board with this crazy idea that I came up with this morning. And thank you for, for bringing all of yourself your whole self into this room today and being so amazing. Thank you. And pass it on. Thank you, Karina, and thank you for using such a, a useful exercise and collaboration to wind up the session on cooperatives. 
So um, thank you to Ramsey and the, the panel for the afternoon session. Now, um, I, I mentioned something earlier about um, trying to pick up on some of the thoughts that came out of, the, of some of the earlier discussions because there was the mention that there was a need for some resolutions to go forward from the, um, the conference. And I've put up um, six topics that I thought might be, in, they might encapsulate some of the, the discussion we've had. So I'm just going to spin the board around. Karina suggested the easiest way to do this is with a show of hands. Karina, were you going to demonstrate the yay, nay, and um, neutral positions for the show of hands on this? So this comes from the Occupy movement, and this is clapping in blind language, so it means yes, I agree, and this means no, I don't agree. Hands like that. Yes, no. Thank you. So... Just to, just to get a feel, because what I'm going to record up on here on these sheets is that there was a high degree of support, a medium or a low degree of support for, for these ideas. And they're, they're rough at the moment. They'll need a wee bit of work, but we'll just see what we can take forward. The first possible resolution is that the Far North District Council Economic Development Committee assists each ward to form a resilient economy incubator group. Now, as you're probably aware, Kai Tyre's already got um, an incubator incubator group with the Time Bank and the, um, the Community Savings Group and so on. But that's, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about also having in the Kaikoui Hokianga area and down in the Whangaroa Bay of Islands area. So Kai Tyre's gazumptas but those two areas, um, we think there might be a need to have a catch up so that those groups are in place. We're, we're lucky enough to start moving with a, a, a complementary currency and so on. So, and just thinking about that, how many people are going to give the sign for yes? Thank you. How many people feel that's a no? That's brilliant. So that's a high degree of support. The next one was that the same committee continues its investigation into the feasibility of introducing a complementary currency into the district. So you're aware that, that those thoughts are already in process, and like Jeff said just before, he and Neil are going to be talking to a combined community board workshop tomorrow, so it's already flowing out. Um, so how many people supported that idea? Yep, thank you. Um, and the Far North District Council, this isn't one that we, we did a lot of talking around, but I've sounded out some people on, that the same committee investigates the feasibility of having some form of banking system here in the Far North, which might be a Far North branch of an established credit union or its own credit union or a branch of the cooperative bank or its own cooperative bank or something along those lines. Hands, please. Great. There's a bit of a theme going here, folks. Right, the next one was, and this comes out of some, some discussion that I'd had, like I said to you, with, with Ruben and Henny, and it's been bounced around the room in the last two days. That Far North District Council investigates what are seen as current or perceived blockages to the way that we're able to settle Maori land and, the mul and multiple title here in the far north and moves itself to a more enabling stance, similar to that that's found in the Western Bay of Plenty District Council area. Now, show of hands. Ru just, just very briefly, I did mention it yesterday. Ruben and Henny went to a, a conference, a hui, recently in Whanganui. And at that Whanganui, at that Whanganui conference on, on housing, it was found that the interpretation that occurs of what the government 
the central government requires local government to do, there's differences around the country. And that Western Bay of Plenty are probably the best example of a council that goes out of its way to work positively, constructively with iwi and helping them to settle multiple title land. So we thought, well, if there's a possibility of good things to be learnt from that and way, other ways of interpreting, you know, central government stuff, then we'd give it a go. People, yep, thank you. The fifth one, that the Far North District Council looks at establishing a grant fund, an economic development grant fund that will assist the community groups to receive training to form co-ops and other forms of social enterprise. So this is, this is a request. Um, please use some of our rate money and blah, 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 coming back into the community in this way. You might miss out on a couple of lights or footpaths in the process, but... OK, and the FNDC investigates the feasibility of having water supply and wastewater treatment systems owned and controlled by local community enterprises. Can I just say congratulations for a start off? And uh, to each and every one of you that have participated and to those who have left, actually, um, a, a big tick because, quite honestly, it, the reason this has been successful is because you made it successful. So thank you very, very much for all that. Now, of course, uh, one of the I, I've had the opportunity to sit through a good part of today, and I've got to say I'm blown away by some of the stuff that I've heard. But more importantly, what I am really uh, excited about, I guess, is the fact of the energy level and the participation and the interest that's been shown. And it's great that that is happening in our community. Uh, one of the things, I guess, of being Mayor is that you get all the nice things to do, and so I have the chance, first of all, to thank the people who have, apart from yourselves, those who have actually uh, also made this happen. And Ken, we were going to... <laughs> we're going to ask the ladies to come out, I think. Is that correct? Yes, please, John. Yep. So we've got Pat and her team up the back there. Would you like to come forward, please, those who have... Uh, provided for us, made the uh, cups of tea and put the, the meals on, etc. cetera, uh, if you'd like to come forward. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, if you'd been here for two days and they hadn't done this, you'd be bloody hungry by the time you got home tonight, so... So uh, let's um, say thank you to each and every one of you. Cheryl. Can, I, can I just say that um, one of the things that's happened, uh, Cliff and Seebeck have made available gift vouchers to the tune of $50 to say thanks to these ladies. So let's give them a big hand. Can we give them an extra big hand, ladies and gentlemen, for... <laughs> well, it's a pretty important place, no matter where you are, actually. Uh, can I also uh, thank very much the presenters who have come and given their time today to... Uh, uh, yesterday and today and thank them for their contribution and the, the, the time that they gave. And uh, I've got to say, those that I saw were fantastic. So let's put our hands together for the presenters. <laughs> Can I thank also the ladies and uh, the admin staff who have actually supported this, who have who've, uh, worked to make it happen. It hasn't just happened over the last couple of days. There's been lots of work going for quite some time to actually bring this together. So let's put our hands together for them if we might as well. A special mention to Martangi. Where are you, Martangi? He's gone to the airport. 
Oh, he's got, gone to the airport. Still well, he's taken one of the... Oh, oh, okay. Well, look, yeah, it, I, Martang, as you may have, has, has done all our um, communications and so on today, the speakers, etc. And you will have seen him walking around. He's a, he's a really great young lad who uh, had a bit of a challenge in his life and has stepped up. And now, quite honestly, he's an enormous part of our council, of our community. And so we need to give him a thanks. And finally, or not quite finally, but uh, two gentlemen that I do want to pay special attention to are two guys that actually really drove this thing, and they're both sitting here, and I'd like Gary and Ken to come forward and just uh, give them a... And, and Cliff, if it's all right, I'm going to give them a voucher each. Finally, uh, the thanks, the, this, this is the final thanks, a part, as I say, from thanking you all, is to ask Di Maxwell to come forward. <laughs> this lady, as you may see, is, is not what you'd call a, a large person. She's a, you know, quite a tiny person, but boy, what a spitfire. <laughs> she, she, she's dynamic. And, uh, you know, when um, we got into council together, uh, we've, I've got to say that council had formed a really special bond, uh, all of us, the, the ten of us that work together. Um, we've, we've come together, um, John Vucic is here and others that have been here through the day, and the community board. When I talk about council and councillors, it's not just myself or Di, there's 29 of us like Sir Pauline and Lewis who have been here and, and uh, Louis have been here and, and others, where there's 29 of us who are council and we quite honestly are a tight team and uh, one of the things we do is we back each other, support each other and we work together. We never talk, there's no personalities ever. It's not allowed in the council no matter what forum it's at and we're here to talk about the issues and make sure that we're here working on behalf of the community. So this young lady here is a big part of that and we just want to say an extra special thanks, Di, for being who you are and for doing what you've done. We want to just give her a special thanks. I just want to say, having a great mayor and a great CEO makes my job so much easier. But sometimes I wonder why they keep talking to me, because I'm... <laughs> get in there with the project I want to do, and sometimes we have quite, um, what would I say, um, animated discussions, and they always say, we trust you, you go and do what you have to do. Well, I think so far they have. <laughs> and um, we, I mean, we've never been able to do this sort of thing in the past. Now we have a mayor and a CEO who believes in what we're doing and will support us to do some great things. And I'm just ever so grateful for that because it makes my time on council a pleasure instead of a blinking battle. So just a big thank you to them and to the staff. I mean, Ken and Gary, I feel sometimes... You know, I've got my own business to run and things like that, and I get pretty busy with some of the other projects and things, and I just said, we're going to have a conference, and these poor guys have just been working their butts off to make it happen. And, you know, it's I'm standing here with the flowers, but they're the ones that are doing most of the work, so thank you to everybody. Thank you. She's so bossy at times, I've got to tell you. So. <laughs> but uh, never mind. Can I also just um, uh, acknowledge Colin Dale? Colin, if you'd just stand, please. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Colin's our chief executive and um, does an amazing job. He's an outstanding guy. His knowledge, his understanding, his communication skills, all those things are special to our district. But apart from all of that, he's just a bloody nice guy. Thank you, Colin. So if I can just make a couple of uh, concluding remarks in closing the conference, I want to say congratulations again to each and every one of you. 
and I'm looking at these six things that you've signed up on, and I'm going to talk about them, but I'm, there's a couple of, couple of things here that I want to talk about uh, that um, I... Uh, feasibility of water. Um, this, this issue here of the feasibility of the water thing, uh, the, the resolution that you've got, I'm pleased to tell you that we're already doing a significant amount of work around that, and so if you've got ideas about that, please feel free to email or tell us, and, um, and we'll be taking those on board, but I'm going to tell you something else about that. I, want, I noticed that Ken mentioned this issue about Maori land and multiple ownership and how we deal with that, and he, he praised the Western, uh, Western, Western, Bay Western Bay of Plenty, saying they're the best council. Well, that was true up until about a couple of months ago, and now they're second. <laughs> because the best one's the far north, and I can tell you what, we've got a template going that's going to see this revolutionise this stuff. We're working hard with the multiply owned Maori land, with the Maori owners, and man, have we, got a, have we got a deal, and it's starting to work already. We've got the wheels turning, and Reuben and others are starting to plug into it, and I tell you what, we're going to make a hell of a difference to this whole district on that issue, and I'm really looking forward to the challenge of it, but we've made, already, we're making great headway, so that's fantastic. Now, I want to just make a couple of comments on, firstly, how we, how we run, how council run. And I was taken by uh, one, of, one of the presenters or ladies who got up here made a comment of, you know, after this, after this conference, we'll go back to living our lives. Well, actually, I hope you don't. From the point of view that I hope this conference has made a change in your life. And I hope that we are as well, because the environment has and is changing. And the way in which we used to work was how we used to, and how we work in the future is how we're going to work. And this council believes in the community. We are community driven. You, one of the things that's so important is that we hear and listen and understand the needs and the wishes of the people who live in our district. And I hear people, and it, you've even got it up here four or five times on your resolutions that you've passed. The council should do this, and the council should do that, and we need the council to do this. And I hear it a lot. used to hear it when I was MP, the government should do this, and the government should do that, and now it's the council should do this, and the council should do that. And you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. But this is the message. The one thing that's important for everybody to understand is that I'm the council representative. I'm a servant of the people. We as councillors are servant of the community. The council is you. And when we talk about the council should do this and the council should do that, my job is to listen and to learn and to stand behind you and empower you, the council, to do it. And that's the message that I want you to take away from me today. You have decided a whole number of things that will make a huge difference in your lives and our lives and in this nation's life. And I'm going to say to you, great, fantastic. You get out there and do it and I'm right behind you. You'll get all the support and backing that you need from the council, from the council representatives. Just remember, the community matters and you do. Congratulations to each and every one of you. You've got our support on those projects. Take the community with you. It, when the community does something, you get a better outcome at less cost. My sincere congratulations to each and every one of you. Travel well. Many thanks, John. Um, I've got a few nuts and bolts things to, to finish up with, but there's something I want to share with you, and that is back in about February, um, Gary and I had had a meeting with Di and with John Vucic when the, the concept of this conference was just sort of being, being shared. And Gary and I went back to work and got in one of the meeting rooms and we started to put together the ideas that have basically what we've been, worked through over the last two days. And we, had, we took that back to die. But that, that afternoon, 
um, when we were working in that small room at, at work, when we had finished, I said to Gary, I came into council nearly nine years ago to do this stuff, and we're finally able to do it. And Gary said, I travelled all the way around the world eight and a half years ago to do this stuff, and we're finally able to do it. And that's what it's like, folks. This has been an incredible privilege for me to be able to do this. I have been at council for nine years last Friday, and this is the highlight of my time, those nine years at council. Um, so that's, that's what it's like for us, and that's... That's why I feel very positive about what's happened here in the last two days and feel very confident that the people we've got in council, um, because there's some that aren't, aren't here and we're going to have, to have to work with them and work the ideas through, but I feel very confident that you've been listened to and will be continued to be listened to. Now, I want to thank the present uh, presenters as well, the, the people who did the keynote speak, uh, speeches and the, the people who are on the panel. It's been fantastic working with you. Um, Shona's already had to go and catch a plane, so I'm sorry Shona's not here, but um, Lawrence, Ramsey and um, Shona, um, fantastic work and the backup from the the practitioner panels, that's, that's been absolutely tremendous. So thank you all for everything that you put in. Um, you folk as participants, you've been brilliant. The saddest thing is that we couldn't have you all up the front from time to time because there's been a huge wealth of information and knowledge here in the room. And as things started to unfold and we were getting the, um, the, the enrolments in and so on, and we realised just who was going to be coming. We were sort of getting a bit dazed by it all. Um, it's, it's just really amazing that people have travelled some distance to endorse this process and what we in the far north have set out to try and achieve. So those of you that came some distance and um, you've got a, a, a good understanding of what you are coming to and you are doing it in that way, thank you very, very much. I also want to thank the sponsors once again, and in particular, um, the Kaitaia sponsors, and in particular, Seabeck, Cliff and Seabeck. Been fantastic help, Cliff. Thank you very, very much for all you've done, and the Business Association here in Kaitaia, and also the Coast to Coast Bakery, which helped us out immensely. Um, the volunteers. Um, I want to make a special mention there. John's already done, done the, uh, the thanking, but I just want to say... When, when the ladies volunteered to do this, the conference was quite small, and the task we were asking of them wasn't all that onerous, and the, and the deal was they were volunteering um, for the koha of coming here and being in the audience of the, of the conference, and they haven't had a lot of that because as the conference kept on getting bigger and bigger, they were the ones that got hit the most by the numbers. Um, in terms of the contribution they made. So I apologise for the way it grew and the number of sauces and cups and everything else happened, but um, Pat and Cheryl, Nancy and um, Trish, and somebody's not here, Waikaria isn't here. Thank you so much for all the backup that you did. Um, We have, got, we have got your names and contact points um, on your registration forms. We'll make a database out of that and, and um, contact you in the next little while. I'll take Gary and I to get our heads around this a bit, but we'll get a database formed and start sharing the information and keep you informed of the next steps. We'll let you know how Jeff and Neil get on tomorrow with the committee board workshop. And um, we'll just keep those ideas flowing, folks. And um, I guess, I hope, there's lots of work to do out there in the future, but we're going to um, keep on doing it and um, make a difference. So thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>